1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 16. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the power of the Spirit and of power. So your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages of our glory to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who, has, who is a spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The word of God for the people of God. I'd like to share an experience that I had in college that played a significant role in the way that I, as a preacher, understand preaching. There was a man who was serving as an interim pastor at a church I was attending for some time that had experienced a fair amount of conflict. And this pastor was someone who was good at negotiating in the midst of conflict, uh, of helping to get people refocused, and he had many other gifts as well. And one thing that struck me immediately was that he was an absolutely captivating speaker. When he stood up to preach, I found myself completely engaged, hanging on every word, absolutely spellbound by the words that were coming out of his mouth. He was widely respected as a preacher. And if you had asked me, I would have told you he was one of the most eloquent preachers I had ever heard. And then one day I noticed something odd. Though I had just listened to another one of this pastor's well-crafted and well-delivered sermons, I found myself, as I walked out the door, asking myself the question, what in the world did he just say? And I wasn't asking myself that because I was shocked by what he had said, or it was just something because I couldn't Remember, there I was, only a few minutes after the service, and I was struggling to recall any part of substance from the sermon. Now, after that, I started to think about the nature of preaching. If preaching is such that everyone who hears it is drawn into it and is impressed by it, and yet they walk away without having heard the gospel... And had God speak into their lives, has it really succeeded? Is it truly Christian preaching? Things like that also remind me of something that Jesus said. He was criticizing the multitudes and asked them some interesting questions about their motivation when they went out to see John the Baptist. He asked, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who's more than a prophet. Essentially, Jesus is saying to the people, look, you knew that John wasn't a prince or a weakling. You knew he was a prophet. He looks like a prophet. He sounds like a prophet. And you went out to hear him as a prophet. So why didn't you listen to him? What did you expect? Did you, did you want to go and hear a prophet and not be challenged by him? That is not prophets work. Paul's version of this quotation, of this question looks more like this. Why did you listen to me in the first place? Is it because I spoke words of wisdom that made sense with everything else you've heard? Did you come to listen to me to just one more wise man with a clever teaching? 
No, you couldn't have, because I didn't come with words of wisdom. I came with demonstrations of the Spirit and of power. You didn't come to believe a message, or even worse, a messenger. You came to believe in a God who loves you and who transforms your life. It strikes me as interesting that Paul would appeal to his unimpressiveness as evidence of the work of God through him. Seems so counterintuitive. Every church wants to have a talented and dynamic leaders, people who are inspiring just to be around, who have gifts of all kinds. Who wouldn't want that? And yet, Paul takes the opposite approach. He says, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom. There's much about Paul's behavior among the Corinthians that was, to put it bluntly, not much to write home about. But that's not to say that he was not a dynamic leader in his own way. He didn't use the rhetorical techniques popular at the time to persuade his hearers. That is to say, in more modern terms, he was not smarmy, (laughs) having more polish on his words than content in them. He came with a message of God come to earth, forgiveness of sins, of transformation that begins in this life but lasts for all eternity. He came with demonstrations of the spirit and of power. He shared the good news that God loved the Corinthians so much that he sent his only son to give them life and life abundantly. From Paul's point of view, a message like that doesn't need fancy speech. In fact, if people get caught up in the delivery of the message, they might miss what the message is telling them. The point that's being made is that if Paul were an outstanding speaker, one who knew how to craft the best sermons that anyone had ever heard, then someone might think that the transformation that took place in Corinth was because of his skills. Instead, he argues that because of his lack of ability, there can be no question that it was God who was at work among them. Paul's argument in this chapter continues on with what he said in chapter 1 about the gospel not being wise in the eyes of the Greeks. And Corinth is in Greece. But rather was seen as foolish. And yet Paul says here that the gospel is not actually foolish at all. But it has a wisdom of a very different kind than many people are prepared to take seriously. One thing's for sure. Whatever wisdom the gospel has, it was not noticed by the mob of people who cried out for Jesus to be put to death. The fact that Jesus could be executed like he was shows that nobody at the time really understood the wisdom of God. Not the Roman authorities, not the Jewish authorities, not the mob, not even the disciples. Because if they had any idea what God was really doing, as Paul says, they would not have put him to death. Paul's inviting the Corinthian Christians, and us by extension, to step out of one way of thinking And into another. He describes God's wisdom as that which no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived. Paul's arguing that if we really want to know God's wisdom, we need to not expect it to be all that similar to the way we're used to thinking. It's a wisdom that comes only through revelation, which means it's something, it isn't something we would have figured out on our own, given enough time. There's nothing in this world of ours that we could see that would make us understand the wisdom of God, of of the wisdom of overcoming sin through the death of the Son of God. There's nothing in all the great works of all the wise teachers of antiquity that would enable us to jump from worldly wisdom to the good news as revealed in Jesus Christ. God's wise and his wisdom is clear so long as we have stepped into a point of view where we can see it and understand it. As long as we insist on finding God and fitting God into the view of the world that we share with the rest of Western culture, we'll never grasp the depth of the wisdom of God. What's interesting is that this acknowledgement that we need to have the foundations of our thinking changed if we want to understand something new, which goes back to Paul has only fairly recently become acknowledged by philosophers and scientists. With Einstein, notions such as space and time that seemed so obvious ended up being radically redefined. The development of field theory 
by Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell turned classical mechanics on its head. What we found is that when these new theories were developed, they weren't seen by most people as the logical step in the development of science, but as radical breaks with tradition, and even as an abandonment of science altogether. Some of the family members of these great scientists accused them of turning to mysticism instead of science. And it's only been because people have been able to learn both ways of thinking and see that the choice is clear, that the new ideas have taken root. The point is that even science couldn't move forward until it allowed itself to realize that the way they've always done things doesn't have all the answers. They had to take a kind of leap of faith into the unknown, allowing the values they cherished to be questioned down to their roots. At the end of the day, what seemed at first to be so counterintuitive turned out to be so much more clear and obvious once we were able to break away from damaging ways of thinking. That's something that Paul realized long ago. The Corinthians wanted wisdom, but they wanted wisdom on their own terms. Wisdom that matched up with what they already knew. The question we could ask is, if you already knew what wisdom is, and you clearly think you do, since you're able to stand in judgment over what is wisdom and what isn't, why do you need someone to teach wisdom to you? If we already think we know what wisdom is, how open are we being to learning something new. Paul's suggesting that the Corinthians are not thinking in spiritual terms that the Spirit of God reveals things above and beyond what we would have imagined without it, and just as importantly, takes the same things that the world sees and puts a different interpretation on them. After all, what this world would call the greatest failure of a human leader, the death of Christ on the cross, the Spirit explains is actually the victory of God over the sin of the earth and the world. It's at the very end of this chapter that Paul points out one of the goals for us as Christians, and that's to have the mind of Christ. That was a bit of evangelistic genius on Paul's part. He clearly knew how to speak the kind of language that the Greeks in Corinth could understand. He knew that there was a long tradition in Greece of valuing the mind and ideas. According to Paul, it isn't a problem to be committed to the development of the mind, but not just any old mind. We as Christians should be concerned to cultivate the mind of Christ. But here's the thing about the mind of Christ. It isn't the same as our minds. If we already had the full mind of Christ, then nothing Jesus ever said would challenge us or make us uncomfortable. If we already had the full mind of Christ, we would live every day doing the things Jesus would be doing if he were in our place. Paul says that we can know the things of God because we've received the Spirit that's sent from God, the Holy Spirit. Through the things that God has done and through the Spirit that's sent to dwell inside of us, we get to know the things of God and we get to live our lives in light of what God has revealed to us and not just in the light of whatever we thought up for ourselves. But all that means that at least sometimes following God's leading will mean that we're called to do things that to others might look foolish or perhaps might rub against the grain of our unspoken social codes. Following God might make us stick a bit, stick out a bit like a sore thumb, and we may not be able to live the quiet life of anonymity that can be so appealing. But that's the price we pay. If we say we're willing to follow God as long as he never challenges us or makes us do anything other than what we would have done anyway, we aren't following God. We're following ourselves. So why are we here on a Sunday morning? When you come to church, what do you hope to experience? A community like any other group you might be part of? A captivating sermon? Moving music? An interactive multimedia experience? The movement of God's Spirit? Let us be a group of people who come together because we want to encounter the Spirit and power of God, who want to be transformed in a way that mere words could never accomplish. Let us be people who live by the wisdom, not of the latest book or life coach, but by the wisdom of the mind of Christ. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen.